and welcome to episode 2.13, the last gasp edition for March 8th, 2023 of Notes from the Isle Seat, the podcast that covers the arts in northern Chautauqua County, sponsored by the 1891 Fredonia Opera House. My name is Tom Lachlan, and I'm your host as we bring you news and information about arts events at the Opera House and around the region, including interviews with artists and creators across the county. The next time you hear my mellifluous voice on this podcast, the vernal equinox will have come and gone, and daylight savings time will be in force. While I'm not naive enough to think that there won't be any more cold or snowy days, for the most part winter will have breathed its last gasp, and spring will be just around the bend. While March is rather an ugly month, where the scenery is relentlessly brown and the ground relentlessly muddy, we march forward to the promise of warmer and greener days ahead. And it's nice to eat dinner while there is still light outside. One of the most lusciously green places in our region is Panama Rocks. If you're in the need of a greenery recharge, then the upcoming lecture on the history, ecology, and geology of Panama Rocks may be just the thing for you. Coming up on Thursday, March 16th at 7 p.m., the Executive Director of Panama Rocks, Mr. Jonathan Weston, will be giving the lecture, and I spoke with him to get a preview of his talk. I'm pleased to be joined right now by Mr. Jonathan Weston. Jonathan is the Executive Director of Panama Rocks down in Panama, New York, and he's going to be giving a lecture on Thursday, March 16th at 7 p.m. Admission is free, and the title of the lecture is History and Geology of Panama Rocks. Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Tom. I'm glad to have this opportunity and look forward to speaking at the Opera House. Great. Um, you know, uh, I mentioned before we started uh, uh, doing this interview that um, probably most people, you know, in this section of uh, New York State, you know, this uh, this Western New York section probably know about Panama Rocks, but I'm not sure that everybody's been there. Do you have any idea at this point? Do you keep tabs on uh, how many people come through and uh, what the what the sort of the name recognition is of the place? Sure. Yeah. Um we currently, in in any given year, um, hope to have about twenty thousand guests over the course of a calendar year season. Um, I'd say a good thirty to forty percent of that are local slash regional. Um, Chautauqua County, um, Northwest Pennsylvania, excuse me, North Northwest Pennsylvania. Erie County, New York, it's around, you know, in, in an hour and a half, two hour drive max would be, I think, uh, 30 to 40% of our guests. And, and, and do you have um, any record of the guest who has come the farthest to see Panama Rocks? I'm, I mean, we've had guests from all over the world, um, uh-huh. China, Iran, even um, Iraq, uh, students from, you know, we, there's students maybe that come to JCC, guests at Chautauqua. Um, people just, maybe they go to Niagara Falls and they're passing through, come down South and they visit us. So, um, and that, that's really one of the fun parts about my job, um, is having the opportunity to meet so many people from all over the world. Um, my, in my past life, I did work actually about a decade in DC and specialized in foreign affairs, strangely <laughs> enough for what I do now. Whoa. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. So actually, I, I specialize in U.S.-China relations, um, working for a congressional commission. And uh, last spring, I actually you know, had a guy come up, started talking to him, and he is actually one of the State Department's China experts. <laughs> and he goes, what are you doing here? <laughs> but he was up, you know, doing a Rhodes Scholar with uh, Chautauqua Institution, which, of uh-huh. course, brings in people from all over. And I uh, ended up coming here. So it was nice to, you know, it's just it's a fun way to meet interesting people. Well, I know that that's that's that that's quite a leap, and of course, one of the things that's unique about Panama Rocks in terms of just it being a park is that it's 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 one of the very few private parks. Most parks, when people think of parks, they think about state parks, public parks, uh, uh, national parks, and things like that. But yours is a private 
Park. Um, and I believe uh, the people who originally bought it bought it way back when. Yes, um, it's kind of an anachronism in that sense. Panama Rocks was founded originally by a gentleman named George Hubbard in 1885. Now, this is actually, so when Panama Rocks opened that year, um, that is the same year that the first state park in the United States was created here in New York by an act of the New York State Legislature, and that's Niagara Falls, um, being about an hour, 45 minutes north. Um, so when Mr. Hubbard created Panama Rocks as a park, there weren't, I mean, there were, you know, city parks, things like that. There weren't parks. There weren't place, you know, really kind of places like this for people to go in an organized manner. I mean, they'd, they'd go, go throughout the woods, but um, in some of our history we might get into, there were perhaps some unsavory things that were happening in the rocks. Um, <laughs> so it cleaned up and got organized. And uh, here we are today. And there are, of course, a few other parks and attractions like us that are privately owned and operated throughout the country, mostly, you know, I'd say this side of the Mississippi, um, because it does usually date to before the state park systems were created. Mm -hmm. And most of them are geologic attractions, as, as we are. In the late 1800s, um, we started, you know, humans started learning a lot more about geology. And there was really a, I don't know if you can call it a craze, but a geology craze. So people were very interested in it. They were learning about the earth from a scientific perspective. And people were just fascinated by it and would flock to sites like Panama Rocks um, to visit. But uh, yeah, we're happy to do it. Like I said, we don't, you know, we're not making a ton of money. We're pretty much almost entirely funded by our guest admissions. We operate on one-tenth the budget of the average New York State Park. Um, we operate very efficiently. We're grateful for our guests. And we generally get really good feedback. You know, we are one of the highest. I'm, I'm going to toot our horn here. Um, it's not me. It's the rocks. You know, so I don't feel like you know so embarrassed about it. Um, since 2012 ish, roughly the year before I came back, I started keeping better track of this. Um, mm -hmm. Based on traveler rankings alone, you know, guest reviews, we've been the number one attraction in Chautauqua County on TripAdvisor. If you just look at the rankings and the reviews, right? Um, and not paying for ads. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, uh, Google has us one of the highest rated attractions in the region. Um, so our guest reviews are, in fact, um, Inspiroc is a uh, international itinerary trip planning service, and they would amalgamate Facebook reviews, Google reviews, uh, TripAdvisor reviews into one. And they actually had us the, as the highest rated trail in New York State based on guest reviews. And uh, so it's pretty, you know, people like it and they don't mind paying the small fee. I mean, it's it's not that I mean, it's not terribly bad to go in. Um, and we do offer season passes or discounts for locals to make it you know more cost effective if you want to come more than more often. But yeah, it's it's highly rude. actually getting and getting back to where people come from and that I last so right before COVID, I remember we I was visiting family down in Florida and I was watching the weather. And this meteorologist comes on, he's talking about a big winter storm that inevitably, you know, comes into western New York, uh, inevitably coming our way. It's going to hit right here in Chautauqua County, he says. And by the way, right there, Panama Rocks, one of my favorite places in the world. Now, I was just blown away. I'm here in like, you know, Fort Myers Beach, Florida. Wow. <laughs> you know, and this, I, and I was Googling and Googling, trying to figure out who this local meteorologist, I couldn't figure it out, trying to find some clip of it so I could put it on our website. I couldn't find it. Oh. Um, that was great. So that is that is great. That is great. You know, and it's really it leads me actually to one of the questions I had for you. And that's, uh, you know, in the 10 years or so that you've been the executive director, what's the what's the most um, perhaps um, unique experience for yourself personally or event that you've uh, gone, gone through in terms of just being at the rocks and spending time at the rocks? There are so many, it's really hard to decide. And from a personal perspective, it might, you know, I don't know things might not be interesting <laughs> to others. I'll, I'll give a few things. I mean, one, we, we've supped some events like our Wild America Festival, and that's always a lot of fun. It happens in late July, um, where we have crafts, people, speakers, music, um, falconers, animals, um, our foliage festival as well. Those are always fun to do. Right now, I mean, probably the biggest challenge of my life is I'm trying to get glamping up and running here at Panama Rocks. Uh -huh. um, so glamorous camping. <laughs> um, and it's been a 
probably the most, I mean, you know, I've graduate degrees from Ivy League or institutions, worked in foreign affairs for the U.S. government, all that's pretty competitive. This is the most challenging thing I've ever tried to do in my life is just get this going. Um, but, you know, I, I'd hope it opened last year. We are delayed. Now my target is, you know, maybe before July of this year, hopefully in line with the Chautauqua season. Um, but one of the more interesting things maybe for, I don't know if it's for others, just when I go in the rocks, I mean, it's kind of like going to nature anywhere, but it's really, you know, Panama rocks is like nature on steroids. You know, it's really, you just go down there. It's very impressive. It's very primal and there isn't energy to it, um, which I hear from many people. And, you know, just, I remember I was walking down there and I wasn't in the best mood. So I decided to go for a walk in the woods and I was just, you know, I told myself, you know, man, it's, it's just, I can't be in a bad mood and be out here. So then, you know, I tried to do marketing on social media. I made a little quote. And my quote was like, you know, it's it's almost impossible to walk in the woods and be in a bad mood at the same time. Put that up on our Facebook page. And this became like a thing, like all like you can Google that. And it's like they abridged it to it's impossible, not almost impossible. But like Eva Shoki, who's like a famous U.S. hunter, was had it on her social media post. It was like all over the place. So I thought that was kind of weird, just interesting, weird. But um, I kind of like I just like that that sentiment that that's impossible to be in nature and be in a bad mood at the same time. I mean, you can be, but most people get better. In fact, you know, there's more and more studies of this that psychologists are literally prescribing time in nature to help deal with stress and anxiety. And I think that Panama Rocks puts a little extra oomph in that, just given the primal, really kind of primal nature that we have. Yeah, I, and I'm, I know you're going to talk about, um, you know, the history and geology of it. So I'm actually trying to avoid those two particular. <laughs> yeah, so far we're not talking about a bunch of anything. I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, good, good. That's that's More what I want. I want people to come and listen hmm. to the rest of it. I don't want them to listen to this podcast interview and say, "Oh, I've heard it all," you know, yeah. but. So it's kind of a, a little bit more about personal to you. So, you know, I mean, you walk in the woods in there and stuff like that, but I, have you ever camped in it? Have you ever, ever pitched a tent and spent time like right in it? Overnight? I mean, I have done it just above the rocks, you uh -huh. know, in, in our forest, which is where our glamping area campground will be. Uh -huh. um, I have never actually camped inside the rock area. Um, my dad with some friends did once a while uh -huh. back. Um our caves are pretty moist, you know, so like they're damp. I don't know that I'd want to overnight in them too much. Um, so no, I've never, I've never done that myself. Well, the, the reason I ask is because I, 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 I'm, you know, if, if you want someone to try it, just give me a call. Because <laughs> All right. Because we can organize if, if you want to, we'll organize it. I'll get a, get a whole experience. Oh, that's great because because I, whenever I look at those formations and I I sort of you know see the the uh, the the ancient sense that they the vibe that they give off. I'm I'm really interested to find out what that vibe is in the middle of the night. How the wind goes through it. How mm -hmm. the you know the the sense of the dampness. Um, the 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 view above, perhaps on a clear night. Uh, those kinds of things. Um, that's the thing I get when I when I look at the rocks. I haven't been to Panama rocks in quite a few years, and I need to get back there. But but when I see the pictures and my own experiences of just taking the walk, you know, it's like wow that they they just they they sort of call to you in a sense to say spend some time here. Well, you know, there's an I I find there's an and I think this is true of almost anybody that there is an energy in nature and and again i mean we, we there's you had the romanticism of the last few centuries you know lord byron writing poetry about nature etc paintings um the great american artistic painting movements um mm -hmm. have been focused on nature um as well as other nations of course other countries and parts of the world but i really feel like that's amplified it, in places like Panama Rocks. Um, yes. He's a novelist, but Neil Gaiman, who wrote the novel, um, in American Gods, I mean, just they, one of the things he talks about is places of power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a different way related to his fictional novel, but I, that, that's that's kind of, a, that's just a phrase that stuck with me, both with Panama Rocks and maybe some other places where you just feel a sense of natural power, calm, energy, whatever you want, however you want to interpret it. But it's, I feel it and many others who come visit feel it as well.
Yeah, I, you know, you have to believe that the history of it before uh, 1885 um, and even before then, um, the Native Americans and, and people, you know, that were there before that, they, it feels like a sacred place to me. I guess that's the best way I can describe it, even when I go. And that's what interests me about it a lot of times, even I, I still remember that. But those types of outcroppings, those types of mm -hmm. unique structures that nature puts in there, it sort of makes makes you feel like you know this is a special place and some you know uh if you if you sit here for a certain amount of time you're going to connect with you know natural forces and 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 uh, that are that you know go beyond just everyday living i feel exactly the same way <laughs> well you would you would know better than i would you've grown up there practically <laughs> yeah <laughs> You know, and I, it's I, nice I find to hear it, it from others. Yes, <laughs> it's nice to hear it from others. You know, well, so. I find it amazing that you know. I mean, I didn't realize this about your background. That you were a U.S. China specialist, and it's like, mm -hmm. wow, from 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 U.S. China relations in Washington D.C. to the quiet of of uh, uh, Panama rocks is quite a jump. Yeah, you could even say it was intentional. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Jonathan, you're better off where you are. So oh, thank you. <laughs> so that's good. Listen, thanks for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate the, the time that you've put in. Um, uh, people are really going to enjoy your lecture, I think, uh, uh, so that they can get a bit more background of the history. Uh, the geology in particular, mm -hmm. I think, will be fascinating. And, uh, you know, I encourage people to attend, especially because it's free. Donations, however, are accepted. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, and I really look forward to that because the, the geologic history and the human history of the park are fascinating. And, of course, I, I'm more than open. I'm going to leave time for questions there. So I'm, I'm more than open to any, you know, appropriate <laughs> question, personal personal questions or questions about other aspects of the park uh as well um but I, I will just leave with one thing and we talk about the power and the vibes in the rocks uh the the formations of the panama rocks are geologically incredibly old they started forming during the early Carbonif carboniferous uh, about 350 or so million years ago this is roughly three times older than half dome out in yosemite mm. um so they're incredibly ancient ancient rock structures um and there's definitely that feeling um and, and sense when you're down there yeah and that's and that's worth exploring and talking about and listening about that's great jonathan thank you very much good luck with your lecture <laughs> thank you tom Have all right day. you too bye-bye the History, Ecology, and Geology of Panama Rocks will be presented at the 1891 Fredonia Opera House on Thursday, March 16th at 7 p.m. Admission is free. Donations gratefully accepted. I've got my routine. I check all the windows and reread my notes on the back of the door. A prayer for the orphan, a song for the widow. She says they don't sing them like that anymore. This spring season at the Opera House boasts a wide selection of live music. And coming up on Friday, March 24th, two groups will be performing their music beginning at 7.30 p.m. The double bill of That One Crocodile, featuring Ben Baker and Friends, and Tough Old Bird, featuring the songs of Matthew and Nate Corrigan, will take the stage with music both old and new. Ben Baker was a featured guest on episode 2.1 back in August of 2022, so if you want more background on his music, check out that episode. I caught up with the Corrigan brothers at their home in Buffalo to get a better idea of what their music is all about. I always love to talk to young musicians because they keep me a little bit more in touch with the music world than I normally am. And I have two uh, great young musicians with me today. Uh, they are brothers, Matthew Corrigan, Nate Corrigan, and the two of them form the group known as Tough Old Bird. And they'll be coming to the 1891 Fredonia Opera House on Friday, March 24th at 730, along with uh, that one crocodile. 
Uh, welcome, gentlemen, to the show. Glad to have you. Well, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Now, um, the first thing I want to get in with you guys is uh, in doing all of my research and looking at your website and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, I'm not a Facebook guy, so I, I, I had to uh, sneak in on someone else's account. But um, you guys don't talk about yourselves all that much. <laughs> there's there's no bio information. There's no how we got started. There's no no nothing. So <laughs> there? there should um, be. We need to talk to our <laughs> web, website team and get that. Yeah, it must be tucked in too deep somewhere. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere it's in there, I'm sure. But I, I and your website is very minimal, and I couldn't. I could. I'm looking at your website now. In fact, I have it up, and I, I it's it doesn't say bio or, any, or history or anything. Like that. So what I'm going to do is ask you to just give us a little history. Well, how'd you guys uh, start as brothers to get into music? Oh, that's a good question. I think we both sort of started getting interested in it independently. If I, if memory serves, around mm -hmm. the same time. Matt was in high school and I was in college. And I think we both just, um, I don't know, we both started playing music on our own at around the same time. And then, you know, we would get together during summer breaks and stuff like that. And we would both have heard a bunch of new stuff that we both thought was really cool. And mm -hmm. we were starting to learn to play instruments and things like that. So I kind of think that's how it began. Yeah, we were both like sharing music back and forth that we found um, and also. Uh, we weren't really writing our own yet. We started doing open mics and stuff, just covers a lot early on, um, just trying to figure out like how to perform really. Sure. And um, we did that for a year or two before we each started just kind of like, you know, going to the other one and be like, hey, I actually have this little piece of a song, like, you know, what do you think? And then at, over time, we accumulated enough uh, together that seemed like a you know, enough to record and release that we were confident enough to show anyone. Man. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, and, and then you just decided, hey, you know, we're here, we're brothers. Let's just, you know, uh, play together. Is that more more or less kind of it? I kind of remember just kind of having a, a conversation that was probably like two or three sentences long where we just kind of like, <laughs> we could be a band. <laughs> right. It's like, we both like doing this. Yeah, let's Why do not? that. Yeah. <laughs> ah, well, you know, yeah. that's that's uh, that's great, actually. Just kind of unusual. I won't say it's unusual to see, you know, uh, siblings uh, perform together, but uh, you've been you've been doing this for actually quite a long time now, almost eight years now, nine years going on, yeah. something like that. Yeah, about that. Yeah. Um. So tell me a little bit about. Um, I'm going to let you talk a little bit, if you would, about some of your musical influences. I mean, when I listened to your music, I I, I had. Uh, you know, a couple of thoughts about who might influence you and so on. Um, but maybe you want to talk about them. So to see, you know, this particular musician really had a, 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 an influence on me. And we, uh, you know, we picked up some stuff from that person. Gosh, that's always hard because it's it's such a long list <laughs> that I'm always, I either don't want to name anybody or I want to list every single person. <laughs> and that's not really possible. Let's start at the, who's who are the big ones? Maybe like John Prine? John Prine, definitely. Um, I always kind of think of like, I try to think of albums that I've listened to yeah. or heard that like are like Keystone albums and John Prine, um, his like greatest hits collection is called Prime Prime. Uh, we listened to the, uh, in the car growing up a lot. Um, our parents had it and that, that one's definitely like in the top five, like most influential like records yeah, I've ever sure. heard. That's exactly who I was going to name. <laughs> oh, good. Is that right? It, Yes. I mean, uh -huh. I, I perhaps I should have put myself out on the line a bit. <laughs> you guys really have a uh, sound like a John Prine influence band. <laughs> but yeah. but, oh, but to funny. hear you say it was like, yeah, yeah, right on. I, I love, I mean, I grew up with John Prine myself. So other ones like Towns Van Zandt was really big early on. Um, like he was some of the first songs I learned to like learn how to finger pick, mm -hmm. really, uh, which influenced my guitar playing style a lot. Um, Gillian Welch was really. Yeah. important uh to um i mean a lot of the, your, your classic uh singer songwriter types bob dylan neil young tom waits you got them all. yeah okay we got them all sure. yeah um a lot of i mean i mean we love i mean a lot of newer somewhat newer anyway rock bands that we really like like rem and and pearl jam to a certain extent i would say or, uh -huh. i think that kind of stuff is probably somewhere in the dna of the music that we write <laughs> as well yeah, well, I had that. I got that. Is it uh, 
Matthew who plays the harmonica? Is that correct? Uh, yes. That's Nathan. No, Nathan. Okay, Nathan plays the harmonica, and when he does, it's like, okay, there's that, there's that Bob Dylan hit, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the other thing about it is um, that I that I sort of captured from listening to your music, your your lyrics, what the kinds of things you write about are uh, quite poetical, very metaphorical, and not you can't really pin down quite what's happening in the story, at least the the storyline of the of the of the lyrics um they just seem to have a, a, a quality about them you know whenever you heard a bob dylan song everybody said well what what was that about what's he writing about because his lyrics are so i won't say obscure but they're 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 covered in you know some kind of mystery you guys kind of have the same thing i mean i i looked at i like i like some of the lyrics very much but some of them are very um ethereal in a way uh yeah i think i've always been drawn to songs that seem very like uh mysterious in their origins and so kind of open-ended that you can pull pull a lot out of them and not exactly know i don't know you can find bits that you relate to and i tend to like to not give away too much and i i, I try to write songs that when a person listens to them they can make them about whatever they're about for them and I think that that to me is more important than what I think a song is about. So I tried, I really try to leave a lot of space for the listener to make a song about themselves. Well, you've been very successful with that, if I might say so, because there's so <laughs> much, there is so much space in, 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 in your music. I, the last song I was listening to um, before uh, uh, we got together and came on the air was Remembrance, which is a, is a, is quite a haunting the tune and, and the lyrics i'm scared of the air and i'm tired of the sunrise the furnace is haunted the stove is possessed there's a speck in my eye or a stain on the skyline i broke off the key in the lock when i left i mean that's that's wonderful those are wonderful lyrics because it, <laughs> well, it, it, you. you know they're 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 so you could make them mean anything you want if you're a listener and that you know but they they really sort of they hit me a lot and the and the one line i really like on on it is uh uh, I've got my routine. I checked all the windows. I reread the notes at the back of the door. A prayer for the orphan, a song for the widow. She says they don't sing them like that anymore. That particular line. She says they don't sing them like that anymore. That, that's that's a great line, guys. Yeah, that, that might be my favorite line. I've always song. liked that one too. Yeah. 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 And and uh, I I I just love what it says about you. Uh, what I heard about your music. I mean, you guys play music. You see, singer songwriters. You know, they don't get on the radio anymore. So that if, and people don't play music like that anymore. Yeah. You listen to what's on the radio, and it's just like, I'm sorry because I'm an old dude. I can't take it. But you know, listening to you guys is like listening to the singer songwriters I grew up with. Oh, that that's that's really nice to hear. Thanks. Yeah. Now, your subject matter, really, you, the other thing I want to touch on a little bit with you guys is that you really hit um, the region a lot. You write a lot of songs about what what I consider to be, you know, the, the region, upstate New York, this this sort of western New York, Finger Lakes kind of region. And I know you guys are, I, I think you're in Buffalo right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, that's your yeah. kind of your home. Mm -hmm. um, you've got a couple of songs about the Great Lakes. One specifically has Great Lake Erie in the title. Um, you, uh, have a song about, um, the village of Rushmore, um, the lake there, which in fact, that, that when that, when the dam was built and the lake was created, they, they drowned a town, you know? That's right. Birchford Lake. Yeah. And that's very specific to the region. Um, do you guys, um, are, are specifically into that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess they say, write what you know. I don't know. Yeah. I think I definitely... Even though, as you say, like a lot of our lyrics are vague, um, a lot of the details that I put in them are pretty specific from various things in my life and have experienced. They're just kind of stitched together in a way that isn't linear anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, I think it, those all kind of come together to create a mood or emotion that is reflected of like the place that we grew up in. Sure. Um, yeah. And I mean, a lot of the music we listen to is, is like, folk and country and blues music and a lot of that is very southern like a lot of it is it was written by people from the south and they wrote about you know Appalachia or wherever it was that they or the delta wherever mm -hmm. they grew up and that's sort of where those songs come from mm -hmm. and so we're from 
here and this it's just kind of that just kind of is the type of songs that we write and yeah. i don't think i don't think we could write any other kind of songs other than yeah i have a hard time writing a song that takes place somewhere else because i've never you know as imaginative as i like to think i am yeah i've never been there i've never lived there and so it's 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 easier for me to write a song about myself um and where i have come from yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense. But I, I, again, that was another thing that caught me as as someone who's, you know, lived in New York State all his life, both uh, uh, downstate and upstate. And uh, you know, just listening to the places is, it's it's nice to be able to hear singer songwriters from the region singing about the mm-hmm. region. Um, so you're going to be coming to the Opera House. You're going to be playing live with um, uh, Ben Baker, uh, from uh, that one crocodile. And uh, you have a couple of albums out already, uh, I know, and you're going to be cutting a third one. And maybe we'll get to hear some of the new music that's coming out at the concert. I think most likely we're we're on the tail end of making a new album. Um, so we're we're starting to debut quite a few songs live these days from that batch. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm sure we'll play something new at the Opera House. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, you've got. Um, I know that the current albums that you have out are like uh, a mantle for the lantern. That's mm-hmm. the, the the one that has uh, some of these uh, the remembrance song that that I picked up. Yeah, um, that's a good one. Um, you did uh, a, a collection of uh, live recordings at the uh, Sunwood Studios in uh, Trumansburg, New York. That's right. Um, that's that's, a, that's also where we're uh, working on our new record. Oh yeah, they're a nice little studio, from what I can gather. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful spot. Is there um, any place people can like uh, 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 pick up your songs or listen to your music specifically? You must have a Bandcamp site. You must mm-hmm. have a Bandcamp site. Um, okay. We have Bandcamp where you can buy uh, digital and CD. Um, we have one album out on vinyl as well. Um, and it's all on Spotify and all the streaming services too. Yeah, you got to, uh, you know, I always um, try and make a point to let that know because um you know, the truth is, of course, that the uh, Opera House, the demographic skews a little bit old. So I want to make sure that, you know, they're probably going to run into people who don't know what Bandcamp is. So I <laughs> right. we'll have, we'll have uh, compact discs and, and vinyl LPs for anybody who wants one. Oh, you'll have some merch there, right? I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Well, uh, gentlemen, it's great. It's been really nice to talk to you and uh, get to uh, listen to you talk about uh, your music. I think that um, audiences who are into uh, singer songwriters, like you say, John Prine fans, and um, uh, so on and so forth, are, are going to really uh, like your sound. Are you guys just coming together yourselves? Or are you bringing any any side people with you, or what? Uh, it's just going to be us. Just, just, just going to be you. Yep. That's even yeah. That's good. That's good. Um, all right. So uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing to you, seeing you there uh, again. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. And um, I think if you've never played that room, I think you're going to enjoy it. So good luck. We're looking forward to it. And as a bonus, here's a little clip from the Ben Baker interview of August 31st, 2022. Um, all right. So let's get into the music here now. It's an interesting album. This this is not an album of music that has like a collection of songs where you spin the song and you can learn the lyrics and then the melody follows real easily and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. There's a it's a it's a much more um uh, uh instrumentally uh deep uh, uh recording. Can you explain a little bit about w- what that means to you that developing that very deep rich um almost non-melodic kind of sound yeah there's a lot of this record especially leans into a lot of sort of noise and like atonal moments i don't want to say that to put anybody off from it being musical in a in a sort of traditional sense right but it does um it blends a lot of sort of my like folk and almost country music Americana influences with more of this freer improvisation, found sound, uh, field recording um, mm-hmm. kind of aspect. So there's there's some just bit the one of the first the first instrument you hear on the record is um, is the piano. Um, yes, ironically, but there's a little bit of like noise before that. There's sort of a tone setting instrumental piece at the beginning which is something i find myself doing on a lot of releases even though i 
tell myself this one's going to be the one without the you know musical intro but this one's got the intro um <laughs> so part of it was just the opportunity um you know when i work on other people's records it's often so time limited but when you work on you know your solo project you have in a lot of ways too much time but you have ultimate sort of nitpicky power because you're not answering to anybody else you're not answering to a clock and you're not billing yourself um so a lot of it was just to see if i could do things you know as an engineer to to learn about how to record different things see right. how things work um there's also just sort of a very narcissistic beauty in singing and playing along with yourself in yes. sort of the one man <laughs> band uh setup uh -huh. um so yeah it's very sort of orchestral in the confines still of what one might call traditional music That One Crocodile and Tough Old Bird will be in concert at the Opera House on Friday, March 24th, beginning at 7.30 p.m. Tickets are $13 for adults and $5 for students and can be purchased online at fredopera.org backslash tickets or by calling the box office at 716-679-1891. Here's the arts calendar for the upcoming two weeks from March 8th to March 21st, 2023. At the Opera House, the Cinema Series continues throughout March with three offerings. All Cinema Series movies screen on Saturday and Tuesday evenings beginning at 7.30 p.m. Living, starring Bill Nye, Amy Lou Wood, and Alex Sharp, and directed by Oliver Hermanis, will be shown on March 11th and 14th. 80 for Brady, starring Lily Tomlin, Jane Fonda, Rita Moreno, and Sally Field, will be screened on March 18th and 21st. And Maybe I Do, starring Emma Roberts, Luke Bracey, Diane Keaton, Richard Gere, Susan Sarandon, and William H. Macy, will be screened on March 25th and 28th. Tickets are $7 for adults, $6.50 for Opera House members, and $5 for students. Available at the door only on the night of the screening. Also at the Opera House, the next Live at the Met presentation will be on Saturday, March 18th. Please note the starting time of 12 noon for this opera. It's the Wagnerian masterpiece Lohengrin. Tenor Piotr Bexala and soprano Tamara Wilson sing the lead roles in this breathtaking score. Please take note that the running time of this Wagnerian opera is five hours. Tickets are $20 for adults, $18 for opera house members, and $10 for students. Live at the Met is underwritten with support from Daniel S. Kaufman and Timothy W. Beaver. SUNY Fredonia takes its spring break from March 11th through 19th, so not too much is happening on campus. The Marion Art Gallery remains open with the exhibit Miscommunications running until April 16th. See the Art Gallery website for gallery hours or check out the February 22nd episode of this podcast for more information. Coming events include the Fredonia Dance Ensemble on the weekend of March 24th and the Fredonia Jazz Orchestra with guest trumpeter Derek Gardner on Friday, March 24th. The Lakeshore Center for the Arts will be screening the 1940 classic movie The Shop Around the Corner, starring James Stewart and Margaret Sullivan and directed by Ernst Lubitsch on Tuesday, March 21st at 7 p.m. Admission is free. Also coming up soon is the Main Street Studios production of Happily, the Musical. Preview is March 23rd at 7 p.m. and show dates are between March 24th and April 1st. See MainStreetStudios.org for more information. If you have a coming arts event and would like to get it mentioned on the arts calendar, send an email to operahouse at fredopera.org or call the box office at 716-679-1891 with your information.
The next offering from the Stage on Screen series is the National Theatre of London's production of Arthur Miller's searing drama, The Crucible. It's a play that looms large in the American theatrical canon, and Mr. Dan Lenzian, who is scheduled to direct a production of this play in 2024 for the Department of Theatre and Dance, agreed to come on and share some of his thoughts about the play. It's always a pleasure to welcome two notes from the aisle seat, Mr. Dan Lenzi. And Dan is a lecturer in the Department of Theater and Dance over at uh, SUNY Fredonia. And he's joining me now to talk about The Crucible, which is coming up uh, at the uh, Fredonia Opera House from uh, Stage on Screen, featuring a production by the National Theater in London. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Um, thank you so much for having me back. It's great to be here. Uh, oh, I love having you. Okay. Um, now, uh, just so that everybody knows, um, neither of us have seen this particular production, uh, but both of us uh, have experience with The Crucible. Um, it was the first show that I ever directed. No, the second show. I take that back. When I got there at Fredonia, I directed a production of The Christmas Carol, and then my spring production right after that was The Crucible, and I was handed that show. I mean, it was like on the bill and I was hired and they said, okay, part of it is you're directing the crucible. And I said, okay, well, I'll do that. And then you now are scheduled um, to direct the crucible in next year's Walter Gluer main stage season. I'm on for the crucible. Yeah. Um, um, I'm really excited by it. It's one of the plays that I always have found to be interesting and challenging and kind of lives in my mind. I think it's also a play that, you know, if you talk to most Americans, they have a passing familiarity with it because for so long it was part of the high school curriculum and the high school canon. I don't know if it is anymore, but a lot of people come in having read it or seen it or being familiar with it from high school. Yeah, they do. And and I know that one of the interesting things for me anyway is sort of a, a product of that era a bit is that um, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, let's say, you know, Broadway and the American theater was a different animal than it was today. And, you know, people like um, Arthur Miller and William Inge and Lillian Hellman, um, all serious playwrights, they were part of American culture much more so than theater is today. Um, and, and, and that goes for Miller. I mean, you can talk about The Crucible, you can talk about um, Death of a Salesman, just about everybody knows about his work. So, uh, you know, that's pretty, that's an accurate assessment. Now, well, I want to say, Tom, though, it's really interesting, right, that like the works of, I, I, I mean, in some ways, Hellman have kind of fallen out of favor and Inge has sort of, is not performed as much, but Miller is um, a playwright whose work is consistently performed, I think, at the highest levels of Broadway and off-Broadway and regional theater and things like that. I, I would say far more frequently than the other two, right? I mean, we just had that kind of landmark a production of um, Death of a Salesman that was just on Broadway that was brought over from the UK um, uh, that played Broadway. And um, there's always sort of talk of new Miller plays coming back around. And so like All My Sons, there were two kind of productions of it, I think pre-pandemic, one in New York and one in London. I believe that was also part of the NT Live series. So Miller's work keeps kind of coming around. I think it comes around too, because a lot of what he talks about is always... Um, there's a way in which a lot of it tends to be so relevant and timeless, you know, it never, it, it, it just never, um, uh, the issues that are there uh, never go away. The struggles of the average man, the, um, the, 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 famil the, the family conflicts that take place in his dramas, that's all the same now as it was then. Yes, yes. I mean, there's, I, and I would say like Inge um, really was delving into kind of like character study. Like when you read Come Back, Little Sheba, um, it, uh, uh, by William Inge, it's such a sort of deep dive into this woman's existence where Miller is is kind of had the real skill of combining kind of family life or sort of or or that kind of deep dive into people's lives and psyches with sort of ta talking about kind of larger cultural and social issues. Exactly. So, so let's let's just dive into uh, the Crucible just a little bit. I remind the audience about what the play is. Uh, it's the story of the Salem witch trials. The women who were all accused of being witches, of being possessed, and there was a group of girls who went around accusing all of these women of being witches um, because they were afraid of having gotten caught uh, dancing out in the woods naked and casting spells and so on and so forth, and basically doing 
teenage things. Um, and the subplot is that um, one of the men, John Proctor, has had an affair with one of those young girls, Abigail Williams, and that also fans the flame of this particular thing. Um, they get caught. There's a there's a huge trial scene and and uh, some resolution after that. So. Um, that is basically uh, the context of the story, but it's more than that, and that's why I think it gets done, because I'm sure uh, you know as well as I do that it was also uh, an allegory for the McCarthy era. Miller was um, sort of called in and testified before uh, the House Committee of Un-American Activities run by Joseph McCarthy um, because of his connection to, I think, attending communist meetings and re the refusal to sort of give names up. Uh, and in some preliminary research that I was doing for today's interview, Miller does kind of talk about how that uh, sort of connected with ideas of Salem. And so some of the um, um, kind of uh, anger, frustration, and fear uh, from that particular time found its way into the fabric of this play. Do you think that you're going to be able to tap into any of that, like in terms of um, uh, cur the current social climate? I mean, well, it's interesting, Tom. You know, as you think about it, I know you're a year away from this, but yeah, I mean, I think I think that there's a reason why the play kind of keeps coming up, and I think that no matter what sort of angle you turn, um, the play can still have a certain. I don't want to say like, hey, uh, relevance or something like that. I am sort of a director that um, uh, I'm always reticent to tell people how to feel. I'll also I'll tell my actors when they start to sort of indicate. Um, no one, do you like being told how to feel? And they say, no. And then I'll say, then why are you trying to tell people how to feel? <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, just in the contemporary world, if we think about the amount of times every day over the last decade, we've heard the terms like witch hunt, right? That means that that phrase has been utilized so much and so frequently that the, the sort of conversations that are happening inside of this play are still part of the cultural zeitgeist. And I, my hope as a director is that when people come and see my work, they're able to kind of draw their own conclusions or um, um, connect, sort of make their own connections about things. And I think that the minute we start, and I don't think you were suggesting that I would do this, but I think it was a great question for uh, food for thought, is that the minute we start to sort of tell people how to feel about something, it becomes agitation propaganda, as right. opposed to kind of, I think what a play does is sort of present a lot of different kind of avenues and ways of looking at things to then force or prompt conversation after people are leaving. So my hope is that the production of The Crucible really allows people to kind of talk about the connections that they're making and perhaps some of the um, um, frequency in which the sort of term witch hunt has been used um, in all arenas over the last decade um, um, and how we move forward. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't help but think about that. Um, I know when I directed it, I did a pretty straightforward production of it. I, I didn't really, it was my first time. So I said, you know, <laughs> let's just play this one straight. But uh, I noticed that in the Nationals production, they've they've done an interesting with it. The thing with it from the trailers that I can see is that they've really stripped it down to the acting. They haven't been so precise with the period, but they really tried to capture the sense of the period, both in a little bit of costume and a little bit of set. And, but the stage is very bare and the lighting is very stark. And I really like, I think, the fact that they're focusing on the acting, the the, the conflict between characters. It is, an, it is a huge acting piece, um, and the language of it is so um, uh, difficult and challenging, but musical and uh, uh, fascinating, and, and the research that I was doing, Miller uh, sort of consulted uh, a, a linguist to kind of help him sort of create the craft of language, which is sort of like this, it's exactly what you just described, what the National is doing, is that it sort of has a kind of flavor or taste of the period, but is also decidedly contemporary language. And, and it's interesting to think about kind of this upcoming production doing that with both set and costumes. And I think that sort of the language and the argument and the rhetoric inside of the play really makes for like an exquisitely theatrical ride. I mean, this is a play for actors to act. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because it's it's not... There are very few dull moments in it, shall we say, very few slow moments. And I think that one of the dip most difficult things that I found as a young director back then was to try to get the timing right, to try and get the builds right within each. It's on, And it's a long play. It's four acts. So to get the builds right within each one of the acts, to get the right sensibility. 
I found that to be a, an enormous challenge. Yes. Yep. Yep. I mean, a good production of The Crucible will fly by, as I'm sure will be seen at the Opera House in the upcoming production. But I also think that sometimes that's why people can be a little bit reticent about seeing it or kind of experiencing it because they may have, let's say, heard it or seen it at a high school or something like that. And, you know, not to be kind of a, a negative about a high school experience, they can be incredibly positive, but it is such a difficult play that really requires a firm hand directing that seeing a bad production of it can make you think, I don't know that I like that play or see relevance in it. And that's why I'm so excited this like, incredible production is coming to the opera house so that people can really experience it and hear it and 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 watch it and i think um um and in, in sort of the greatest of arenas and i hope to kind of elevate and really do an incredible job here at fredonia yeah i i i i wish you a lot of luck and i and i'll, I'll say one thing i don't i don't i don't say this as a piece of advice but i i don't know if you noticed in the trailer but i was watching two or three of the scenes that i found on youtube on the trailer to see what it was like and as i was watching it i i heard in places in the scenes that i saw uh, some audience laughter that seemed to be laughter in the wrong place. I don't know if you noticed that or you saw that or anything like that. So I, I began to wonder, I wonder what the language and the situation of this play will do now with an audience 2023. I've seen a number of kind of recent productions of it. Um, and yeah, mm -hmm. tell me about yeah, those then. Uh, what? sure. So I saw, I think it was, a uh, uh, Ben, which Ben Wishaw, whose cue in the recent James Bond movies was playing sort of John Proctor. Um, and then, uh, it was other British actors and Saoirse Ronan was Abigail. Saoirse uh, Ronan was Abigail Williams and Sophie Okonedo was Elizabeth Proctor. It had a lot of, a lot of big uh, British names in it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And it was directed by Ivo Van Hova, who's sort of a, a Dutch director who really deconstructs things. Right. It was, a, it was a wild production because in it, um, it's sort of the, the witchcraft in the sort of crucible is, um, it, it, it seems like, uh, or, or I think I would interpret it as that it's being made up by the young women in the town of Salem. However, in this production, the witches were flying and the sort of, I think the, the, the scene before the large uh, trial scene, they had what appeared to be an actual live wolf on the stage. And Whoa. so this was a <laughs> real deconstruction of the crucible. Mm -hmm. However, um, it's still... Like, while there was a lot to kind of, I'll say, get past, or it was asking a lot from the audience to watch this production, um, it still landed. It still mm. landed. Um, I also saw an off-Broadway production with the company Bedlam, um, where I think it was like eight actors, and the start of it was decidedly a little comic, playing with tempo, with people sort of looking almost like robots sweeping, and it was a very strange thing with a lot of doubling and tripling, and the same sort of thing happened, where I think at first, and this could have been part of the directorial intent, that we were kind of thinking, oh, this is sort of silly, or this isn't going to land, or, and the play just snuck up on you when that happened mm -hmm. and so I, I guess in my production i wouldn't want i would never want to lean into the comic with the play i think it may for my production do a disservice but i think that um the the, the structure of the play is so strong that it can really hold the craziest of concepts or i shouldn't say crazy it's pejorative it, 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 it can hold the um, um the most imaginative or uh, biggest deconstructions because the structure of the play is so strong and because it really lands with great actors. But I also think that the conversation that you and I are having is is going to be able to bring perhaps the people who have listened to this podcast a whole different perspective just in watching the Nationals play about, you know, what this play continues to say about us as people. I certainly hope so. You know, I certainly hope so. I, I mean, um, whenever I hear of a production of a crucib of The Crucible, uh, like I said, I always want to see it just to kind of wrestle with the play or it's it's one of those sort of epically sort of large plays too that every time you see it, it communicates something different to you. It makes you consider or think about something. Um, I was involved with a summer stock organization called Parallel 45 um, that uh, was or is in Traverse City, Michigan that has um, an outdoor theater space under a tent. 
And they did an incredibly contemporary stripped down production of The Crucible last summer uh, that was all in contemporary clothing. But one of the interesting things about it was under a tent outside, uh, sort of being surrounded by the woods gave you a completely different feeling of where you were, what was happening. You know, I mean, there was a moment um, in the play that was kind of brilliant where, um, um, and it was intentionally meant to be funny to kind of contrast with the horror later where, because it was super contemporary, uh, John Proctor said to Abigail, what's for dinner? And she said, "Uh, rabbit, and handed him a box of Trix cereal with, (sighs) the rabbit on and the director was so brilliant in doing that but audiences in seeing that production i think sort of with the some of the humor that then de-escalated into horror especially in an outdoor stage which is different than a proscenium right like because with the world around it like it, it, it had to be sort of directed differently people said i now understand or like the crucible more than I ever did in reading it in English. And I think that this production, or in English class rather, that this production at the Opera House has the opportunity to really open that door for people. And Great. then maybe they'll come back and see it at Fredonia, which would be even better. Yes, of course, you know, I, and, I, and I hope that they do because it's a, it's a play that I think will kind of never go away. And, uh, and it's something that if you're a theater lover, you really need to see at least one production of The Crucible, I would imagine. Dan, thank you very much for talking with me. I mean, I could probably carry on this conversation for another half an hour or so, but, you know, time is what it is. And uh, uh, I always appreciate you having as a guest. And, you know, a year from now, maybe you and I will be sitting here once again talking about this play. You got a challenge, my young friend. (laughs) I sure do. And thank you for saying that I'm young. I I will hold that on to that forever. (laughs) Thank you very much for your time, Tom. (laughs) Thank you, Dan. Bye-bye. The National Theatre of London's production of The Crucible will be screened on Saturday, March 11, 2023, beginning at 1 p.m. Tickets are $15 for adults, $10 for students, an absolute bargain to see productions of this quality, and can be obtained online at fredopera.org backslash tickets or by calling the box office at 716-679-1891. The Stage on Screen series is sponsored by Dr. James and Marcia Merrins. A couple of notes before wrapping up. If you haven't seen it already, I encourage you to read the profile of our esteemed executive director, Mr. Rick Davis, which appeared in the March 4th edition of the Evening Observer. The profile celebrates Rick's 17 years as executive director and details his struggles and successes in presenting high-quality arts programming to the region. His support for this podcast has been unwavering, And I'm proud not only to call him my boss, but also a valued colleague and a friend. And it's never too early to mention that registration is now open for the 1891 Run for the Opera House. This year's annual 5K Run Walk will take place on April 23rd, 2023, beginning at 9 a.m. You can get all the information you need, as well as register online at fredopera.org backslash the hyphen 1891 hyphen run. Check the show notes for this podcast for links to the information and registration pages. And that's it for this last gasp edition of Notes from the Isle Seat. My thanks to Mr. Jonathan Weston, Mr. Matt and Nathan Corrigan, and Mr. Dan Lenzian for being my guests on this episode. Notes from the Isle Seat is a production of the 1891 Fredonia Opera House in Fredonia, New York. For more information on any of the Opera House's events, call the box office at 716-679-1891, visit the website at www.fredopera.org, or email at operahouse at fredopera.org. Notes from the Isle Seed is now available wherever you get your podcasts and also on the Opera House YouTube channel. If you like this podcast, please consider following us by clicking the follow button on our home website at isleseat.podbean.com and spreading the word through your social media feeds. If you have an arts event you'd like featured on the podcast, why don't you drop us a line at operahouse at fredopera.org and we'll see about featuring your event. Please try to give us a month's advance notice if possible to facilitate timely scheduling. 
If you have any suggestions, comments, or criticisms of the podcast, just drop us a line at operahouse at fredopera.org. We'll be glad to receive your feedback. Our next episode will be available on Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023. I'm Tom Laughlin, and until then, be safe out there and be kind to one another.